You're watching a Hanford Communities Issue Briefing, highlighting important environmental cleanup issues at the U.S. Department of Energy's Hanford site in southeastern Washington, issues affecting citizens of the Pacific Northwest and the nation. The Hanford Communities Organization was established in 1994 and is comprised of the communities surrounding the Hanford site, forming one voice to advise the Department of Energy on important transition and cleanup issues. Good morning, I'm Ty Blackford. I'm president and CEO of CHPRC. Good morning, I'm John Eschenberg. I'm the president of the Washington River Protection Solutions. Good morning, I'm Brian Vance from the Department of Energy, manager of the Office of River Protection and the Richland Operations Office. Good morning, Val McCain. I'm the project director for the VIT plant, Bechtel National. Good morning, I'm Bob Wilkinson, president for Mission Support Alliance. Good morning, it's really a pleasure for us to be here today. Um, to represent the Hanford site in a little bit of a different way than we have historically done, uh, focused on the past, present, and future view of, of our work here. Um, the Hanford site, we have about 350 federal employees on board overseeing the work of eight to 9,000 people on the site uh, allocated across our prime contractors for a site that's about 580 square miles uh, in, in, in size. Uh, with an annual budget of about $2.5 billion per year. Um, our single focus as a Department of Energy, as the customer for the site, is the safe, effective, and efficient cleanup of the Hanford site. Um, it's a singular mission, we have a singular purpose, and we work together with our contractors to execute that important work. Um, as we've talked about the Hanford site in the past, We've not always focused on the broader perspective of history here at the Hanford site, which I think is an important backdrop to where we are today and where we're moving in the future. So we'll start with a view of the Hanford site um, at, its, at its beginning, as this is the 75th anniversary of the B reactor and the T plant going into operation, uh, which was a part of the Manhattan Project, set the course for the end of the World War II and started the, the national security mission that for us lasted more than four decades long uh, through 1989. As we think about the site as it was constructed in support of Manhattan Project and before and beyond, this really does represent a great public work of the last century given the, the amount of work and the history that this site has in support of our national security mission and the objectives of the nation. Um, at, the, at the height of the project, or at the height of the site, um, we had nine operating reactors uh, throughout its, its history with all the infrastructure and facilities to support that. 20 million pieces of uranium metal fuel were produced here and the associated facilities to support that. 110,000 tons of fuel were processed through five different um, extraction plants, uh, resulting in 177 underground tanks with what is today 56 million gallons of waste. But that effort produced 66% of the nation's plutonium, which was 76 tons. Um, and the focus of the site during that period was predominantly on the national security mission. So environmental protection, which was at its infancy at the beginning of this effort, um, was and, and progressed throughout was a secondary priority um, to the national security mission. In 1989, we transitioned to this national uh, cleanup effort at the Hanford site and with the start of a tri-party agreement that was signed between the Department of Energy, uh, the Washington Department of Ecology, and the Environmental Protection Agency, which has set the course in many ways for the cleanup effort that we've been executing over the last 30 years. So this is our 30th anniversary of our cleanup effort as well. Um, that that um, agreement started with 161 milestones, um, which has increased over time as the work was progressed because at the point where this, the document was signed, um, environmental cleanup was effectively a new science. 
And over the last 30 years, we've completed over 1,600 milestones, largely on schedule, as we executed this important work. And again, our focus has been overall to reduce the risk along the Columbia River and move towards the Central Plateau where we're building the infrastructure for the longer term mission that will be executed uh, for the tank waste cleanup effort. So the effort to date in large measure, I'll, I'll talk briefly again at the end, has been a phenomenal cleanup effort. And I'll show some representations of what cleanup looks like on the site. Um, and you can see, we'll, we'll walk through a series of the reactors, the before and after picture, um, to show the significant amount of work that's, that's been accomplished to eliminate the infrastructure and place the, the six of the nine reactors so far in interim safe storage. You can see as we walk through, and I just, I'll just highlight, please look at the amount of infrastructure that was required to support these, these reactors when they were operating. And you can see the phenomenal amount of work that's been accomplished over time to reduce that risk to the Columbia River, re remove that infrastructure, and really just get down to the reactors um, that are cocooned and in interim safe storage and will be there for the longer term until they're ready for future disposition. Uh, really a phenomenal effort that took the work of many, many people on the site over a very long period of time to deliver this kind of progress uh, in the period that we're talking about, which for the reactor uh, effort really was in the early, mid to 2000s to the mid 2015, 2016 timeframe. This is the 300 area. This is the before picture. This is where the fuel processing was accomplished. And if you'll anchor your view on the, the, the one plant with the stack in the low, mid, mid to low right hand corner, you can see the phenomenal amount of work north of that facility that was accomplished to remove those facilities. And we've actually transitioned to placing signs out on the site to show where cleanup has occurred because after cleanup's completed, it looks like the rest of the landscape. And so people often forget how much work has actually been accomplished to achieve that, that spectacular outcome in all these reactors and all these sites uh, across the entire site. So with that, I'll turn it over from a past, present, and future perspective. I'll turn it over now to, to Ty Blackford to talk about a little bit more of the current uh, state, and we'll work through the, the contractors here at the table with me today, and then I'll summarize the national cleanup effort, or the, the environmental cleanup effort to date uh, as a backdrop and to set the stage for our future mission. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ty. Thank you, Brian. So. As uh, Brian noted, um, significant progress has occurred. And I think uh, some of us will remember back in 2008, let's go back just 10 years, 11 years now, um, the department came up with Vision 2015. And then after that, Vision 2020, if we will all recall that. Vision 2015 was geared to protect the river. So as you've seen, clean up the river corridor, get off the river, uh, of course, a major portion of that for us is, of course, groundwater. Groundwater is, is one of the major contributors or was one of the major contributors to uh, potential threats to the Columbia River. So this slide here, uh, we have installed an awful lot of groundwater infrastructure over the years with the department. Uh, and I'm proud to say that that vision of protecting the river, if you just see this slide right here, this is a plume of the... Uh, hexavalent chrome uh, along the, uh, just uh, north of the reach. And you can see those plumes have actually shrunk and come away from the river. So that system, those processes as part of that vision are indeed working. Uh, right now we have miles and miles, hundreds of miles of pipe, uh, several pump and treat facilities every year we pump new and higher amounts of groundwater. This last year alone, just a little under 2.5 billion gallons of groundwater was treated. Um, and we are working right now with the department to increase that capacity even further to treat more groundwater as we move up to the central plateau. Of course, we have talked about the reactor processes and of course 100K. Here's a picture of 100K in 2010. Uh, if we look a little bit further, that's what 100K looks like today. So most of the 200 
or the 100K east areas, the reactor area to the east, is removed. The only thing that's left is the reactor. Uh, as a matter of fact, most of the uh, clear wells, the settling ponds, all of that stuff has been uh, remediated, removed, and covered. So progress continues to be made. Uh, recently, we just completed one of the last major key points that we needed to take care of. If we will recall, the K basins uh, for a lot of years held fuel. That fuel corroded uh, and caused a lot of problems for us and concerns for us as a community, contractors, and the Department of Energy. Um, so major technical hurdles had to be overcome in that regard. Uh, we went through fuel recovery, sludge consolidation, uh, found fuel. Some of us will recall found fuel uh, as we had to go deal with that, and as well the knockout pots. That's all been accomplished, and just last month we did finish the last of the sludge removal from the K area, a major lynch pin right now for us to be able to finish the 100K area and finish the K West reactor. Uh, so we're actively right now in the process of removing debris, characterizing that, cleaning out the cells, and we're within a few years right now of closing the 100K area for good. Uh, so significant progress continues there with a little bit more to do, but we got to remember where we came from. I think we also need to remember is there's hundreds and hundreds of sites that have been cleaned up on the Hanford site. Burial sites, uh, cribs, ditches, uh, you name it, it has been out there. Uh, we just recently finished one of the last major cleanups, the 61810 burial ground, uh, some will recall, which is actually along a major highway which goes to Energy Northwest uh, and is, has public access. It's just a few miles from us right here. Most of us know where that is. And I'm proud to say is that particular job, as you can see, is now finished. This actually is a little bit different. As Brian told you earlier, now it's hard to see because the grass has grown back, uh, the tumbleweeds are thriving, uh, and we have returned to that natural landscape. So we just completed that this last winter. And it's working, and we are now recovering that land. Uh, quite, quite the feat for a job that everyone said would never be done, that couldn't be done. But we need to look a little bit further as we go forward, of course. Um, we're continuing on the 300 area. As Brian showed you, the 324 facility, uh, certainly a major concern to all of us, just because of its proximity to the community of Richland. Uh, we're in the active progress right now on that uh, particular project uh, with doing what we call our facility modifications. As everyone will recall, there was a plume that was found underneath that building, uh, which when that building was being prepared for demolition previously, stopped that process. Uh, we are now in the progress of actually modifying the facility and revamping the facility to bring it to a point where we can actually remove the floor from underneath the building, use the building as protection, and remove that soil from within the building, which will facilitate our ability to uh, tear that building down in the future. Again, that project is moving along very well. Uh, we have the support to continue those activities. We are moving along on it, and we're within a few years of finishing that project up as well. Uh, cesium strontium capsules, another major concern uh, to all of us and to the communities. Uh, I'm pleased to say that designs have been completed on that project. Uh, we actually are in this year starting to move forward with construction, uh, testing, demonstration, and preparation to actually start removing the capsules within the next couple of years and finish that up by 2025. That resolves that risk for everybody. Now we don't have to worry about capsules anymore representing a risk to the workers, the public, or the site. Plutonium finishing plant. Another major challenge, one of the uh, most contaminated facilities in the world uh, has presented quite a few challenges and we have learned a lot from it uh, over the years. Um, pleased to report this picture is actually um, a little out of date. Uh, right now we just finished yesterday what we call the lower risk portion of demolition, actually the day before yesterday. And it's basically, there's not much of that facility left, but we still have work to do. And that work is moving into what we call the second phase of demolition, the final phase. Uh, we'll be starting that as a matter of fact next week. That will continue on for the next couple of months. 
but literally the plutonium finishing plant 2345Z uh, should be done within the next few months. That's the picture as of yesterday. But we need to think about what we have learned as well and going forward <coughs> what the function of the central plateau really is uh, as we move along into the future. <coughs> so if we look at uh, what is present, now we look into the future. You know, we've completed uh, the, the final um, uh, tasks along the river corridor. As we finish those up, we're all moving to the central plateau. That was the plan. Get everybody off the river, move up to the plateau. That creates its own problems. That creates its own challenges. Footprints is, is up on the plateau is, is pretty tight. When you have tank farms, a waste treatment plant, uh, a waste management facilities and all that go with that, and demolition and risk reduction. So everything that, that I potentially do has the potential to affect uh, John and his task, Val and her task, uh, Bob and his task to support infrastructure as well as I rely on Bob to provide me infrastructure so that we can manage these risks. Uh, you see the picture down below, the Purex Waste Tunnels. I believe all of us can remember uh, the lesson that the Purex Waste Tunnels taught us. Uh, and that is, if it goes wrong, it affects all of us. And that includes our communities, that includes the region. Uh, so we have learned from that and we are now actively looking forward to what are the next levels of risk reduction that we need to deal with to protect the mission going forward, which is tank retrievals and making glass. Uh, so we have a, uh, a lot of areas, the re uh, redox facility, which you see up in the, uh, in the upper right uh, corner. Um, we have to work with that because we have a laboratory sitting right next to it that the WTP and tanks depend upon. Um, you know, plutonium finishing plant, you can see the projection of what it will look like in just a few months, but we're not done. There's still risks there that need to be taken care of. And they're not visible because they're below ground. So there's still a lot of work for us to do on the central plateau uh, and learn how to work through those processes. And of course, the last, as you see in the lower right, is our new disposal facility that we are now working to bring up online, which will support directly the disposal of glass that will be made from the WTP. So a lot of progress being made, uh, a lot of progress going right now, and a lot of work to do into the future. And with that, I think we'll start talking a little bit about the future and turn it over to Mr. Eschenberg. Thanks, Ty. Washington River Protection Solutions is a company that's 3,000 people strong, and those 3,000 people are focused on one objective, and that's to make glass. And while we don't actually make the glass, Val's team will. We support the waste treatment plant in three specific ways. First, we consolidate waste from the older single shell ta tanks into the newer double shell tanks. Secondly, we're focused on rebuilding our infrastructure. And this is the infrastructure to supply waste to the waste treatment plant. It, that consists of an underground series of pipes and utilities. We want to make sure that we've got a very dependable, reliable, and durable means to supply waste to WTP. And then thirdly, we're focused on other infrastructure improvements, including uh, what's called the tank side season removal capability. And that's where we'll actually pre-treat the waste before we send it over for vitrification. So th those are our three principal focus areas, but again, it's all about making glass for us. And so with that, I'd like, to, I'd like to walk you through a quick video. If you could play the video, please. So here, this is our tank retrieval operations. These are operators at a console. Today, we're, we've retrieved 10% of the total tank inventory. We're working on on tank AX102 now, here we have operators at the console. Our retrieval method is robotic. We use a, a series of high pressure water, uh, low pressure water, hot water to dissolve and move the, uh, the materials in the tank for removal. This is a picture of a tank when the waste has been completely removed. It's a mosaic picture, a little difficult to discern. <laughs> Infrastructure improvements, here we're doing a, a briefing on site. 
you'll see that um, this is a, a pump removal activity. You can see it's labor intensive. This is much like the Stanford Marching Band. It's a well choreographed event. This takes the better part of a day. It's high hazard work. This particular pump's about 65 feet long. It's a slow, deliberate operation. Here we're upgrading some of the infrastructure to support tank waste retrievals. That's actually a new, a new hot water heater. I mentioned the tank side season removal capability. This actually treats the waste. This is a view looking to the south. This is the closest tank farm. It's called East Farm. You can see the waste treatment plant in the background. Waste will come into what's called AP Farm, which is the closest tank farm to the waste treatment plant. The waste is processed through the tank side season removal system. We use ion exchange to pull out the radionuclides. When the ion exchange columns are loaded, they're actually stored on the pad there. You see the small forklift. And then waste is fed forward to the WTP for vitrification. This is a, a view of an ILAW canister. You see the carousel there when the glass is, is poured, they're loaded into uh, the canisters and they're taken to on-site shallow land disposal. For us, it's all about protecting the environment and protecting the river. Okay, so at, at the top line, uh, it's all about risk reduction. Uh, you, you see what we're doing, all of us here, we're all about reducing the risk to um, the community, to the environment, to the Columbia River. Infrastructure improvements, we talked a lot about that. We're investing millions and millions of dollars to upgrade the infrastructure to support not only the feeding waste to the WTP, but it's also about treating the affluents that come back from WTP. So it's, it's a very interconnected, integrated system. They're in the need to make sure that we have high confidence in the reliability of all of our support systems, whether it be the effluent treatment facility, whether it be our evaporator, or the means by which we supply waste for vitrification. Uh, for us, um, in the lower left-hand corner here, accelerated operations. When Val and her team energize the low activity waste melters, that's a big day for all of us at the table. And it's, it's big because the melter uh, and Val will talk about this, but once, once you turn the melter on, you can't turn it off. And so we have to make sure that all of us um, have the means where we can reliably support that operation of the melter. And we do that, it's 24 seven, it's around the clock, there's no days off, there's no holidays, we have people here around the clock. And so that pace of operations for all of us is gonna increase dramatically. Uh, Brian touched on it. We've not had full scale production operations on this side in decades. And to transition from what's principally a day shift operation into round the clock operations requires a huge shift in everything that we do from a cultural perspective to how we staff and man all of our individual work fronts. The last piece I'll just mention here, a little bit of bragging. Uh, we are leveraging uh, advanced technologies and digital transformation. We're all familiar with digital transformation and how it, it's, it's literally changed the world uh, in everything we do from healthcare to training. We've also taken advantage of those technologies and digital transformation in what we do uh, to manage the tank farms. So for example, we've consolidated a number of our control rooms into a singular control room. We've gone from clipboards and pens to taking shift rounds in an with an iPad. So this true digital transformation it's safer for our workers, it's more efficient, it's more predictable, and it's all about, for us, it's about um, making sure we're as efficient as we can and, and supplying waste and supporting the waste treatment plant. That's what we're all about. And so with that, Val, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass it uh, Great. Thank you. to you. Thanks, John. Okay, good morning. Uh, Val McCain, I really appreciate the opportunity to share some of the VIT plant story with you this morning. Um, you can see in this very first photo here how the job site looked early on in the project, kind of the first chapter of our story. You know, back then the plan was for WTP to be a pilot plant. Uh, the initial conceptual design 
uh, was for a small scale set of facilities intended to treat a limited amount of the tank waste. And over the course of the project's development, as more became known about the tank waste and characterization activities continued, the design and execution strategy for the plant uh, evolved into a massive um, full-scale set of facilities. So it shifted from that pilot plant to a full plant uh, with uh, higher throughput. So as many of you know, and as John talked about, today what we're implementing is the DF law portion, um, which is gonna get us to um, treating the low activity waste first. And so I'm gonna give you a snapshot of kind of a current picture of the site today. Uh, it includes all the facilities in place to support that current focus. It represents meaningful and visible progress towards writing DF Law's final chapter, which will get us to glass. So from a big picture perspective, we finished design in the summer of this year, June of 2019. All the major procurements are behind us. In fact, yesterday it got pictures snapped to me of, of our last major procurement arriving on site. So we've got all our major equipment and bulks to finish the plant. Uh, we're out of the construction business nearly, and we're making significant progress in startup and testing activities. So just to, to touch on construction for a bit, in May of this year, we completed the construction for the balance of facilities. We refer to, refer to that as BOF. Um, it's 20 different utility systems needed to support the plant, consider it the utility backbone for the facility. Uh, we've completed the construction in the analytical laboratory, uh, low activity waste facility. And so what really remains from a construction standpoint, this kind of the significant piece of construction remaining is for our effluent management facility or EMF. And that was a newer facility that we had in place for the DF law mission. So that's well underway. And um, if you go out to site today, you're gonna see you know, the buildings up, um, the, the sidings up, the roofing's almost complete, and we're, we're really into the nitty gritty of the remaining piping and electrical activities in there. And so uh, tremendous, tremendous progress. But this next slide, uh, we're, where we're at right now is we're really deep into the startup and rigorous testing phase of the project. Over the coming months, more and more of our facilities will be going through startup and commissioning, and that's to prepare for operations. And so a brief snapshot of that progress, um, for those utility systems that I mentioned, uh, nearly 70% of them have already gone through that startup phase and have been handed over to our, our plant management team for commissioning. In the laboratory, over 75% of the lab systems have already been through startup and are with commissioning. And um, we recently accomplished um, a kind of a major integrated operation in the lab, which is to get our ventilation system um, running to provide cooling in there. So it, it might not sound like a big deal, but it's a big deal to have, have that up and running. And so I, I see in the next couple of months that um, we expect to have completed all the startup in both the lab and the balance of facilities. In our low activity waste facility, um, which is really the heart of, of DF law, nearly 85% of those systems are in startup, and a significant number of, our, of those have already been handed over to our plant management team as well for, for commissioning activities. And in the EMF, or the effluent management facility, even though I said it's kind of where we're at in the heart of construction right now, we've already started handing over, turning over systems into startups hands, and even just this week, um, some of the smaller systems um, related to the uh, powerhouse have been handed over to uh, commissioning. So making a lot of forward progress um, in that area. So if you come out to site, you see a lot of the, um, I call it the landscaping, but a lot of the site, the fencing, paving, and, and that groundwork being completed as well. So uh, really good progress there. And kind of as we look, look forward, um, you know, we have a good line of sight on that completion of the construction activities and startup. And so now it's really, um, you know, getting that line of sight and focusing on a readiness and commissioning towards the finish line of the project. Some key activities include a hiring of our permanent plant staff and training them and then moving into facilities to prepare for operations. So a couple examples of that. Um, while we're completing the analytical laboratory today, uh, we've been making use of an off-site laboratory at Columbia Basin College in Pasco. And we've had a group of our lab techs that have been there 
uh, and chemists that are already kind of, they're going through training, working on the procedures, developed and went through all our analytical methods. And so they're on pace to move into the laboratory um, actually later this month in November. And so that's a real exciting um, a phase of the project to begin with that, another core kind of permanent uh, plant staff coming on board. We also began hiring and training permanent plant staff who will operate the VIT plant. So we have 95 commissioning techs on board right now who are either in training or you know, at our simulator building or focused on running those utilities 24-7. Uh, we have two more waves of classes to go. The next wave will be, we've hired them, they'll be starting in December. And this summer, uh, several of you may have been out, we celebrated the completion and opening of our, our law annex building and control room uh, with a ribbon cutting ceremony. And that's just a major accomplishment for the team. So as we're closing in on this chapter, um, you know, the teamwork and collaboration and partnership is really key to, to the challenges in front of us to get into completion. I can't overemphasize that. Um, there's no easy button. I joke with John because he throws that video up and it shows the process and it looks really smooth and, and simple, especially when you fast forward some of your activities on site and it's, it's, it's not easy. Uh, it's, it's taking all of us as teams working together closely. Uh, that includes our business partners, um, building trades, state organizations like Ecology, and the community as yourself to, to help bring this plan online and make glass. It, it requires all of us. Um, I think what's, what we're sensing is different right now at this stage of it. The team I know out at the VIT plant really believing that we're getting done. You can sense something different in the air about it. Um, I can sense it with you know, my colleagues here. John hosted um, me and, and several of our leadership team out at the tank farms a couple weeks back so we could um, just get a sense of the progress they're making and the challenges that they have. And I just think it's a really good collaboration and our, our teams are working together on mission integration so that we're all ready at the same time to, to make glass. And so anyhow, it's, it's a, an exciting time to be on the project and, and for me, I consider it a real privilege to be here and to help um, make this next bit of, of history out at Hanford. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Bob. Good. Why, thank you. Good morning, everyone. So um, Mission Support Alliance is probably the unique one up here speaking about it because we, we basically, our contract exists to enable um, John and Ty and Val to be able to execute their mission. Um, and we do that through, through a various service delivery model that, that includes infrastructure, but it's a lot more than infrastructure. And, and it really is in those three main areas up there, integrated services, uh, site-wide services, and then our physical systems and our physical services. And, and what that service model that we have laid out gives us the ability to, to uh, one, enable the, con the contractors. Two, it allows us to integrate um, the overall picture for Hanford because there's a lot of things going on and to make sure as those things integrate together, we're not stepping on each other's shoes. Um, it gives us flexible service delivery so you know what you're buying, when you're buying, and how you pay for that. And, it, and it, that gives transparency into the process. And that transparency really allows us to make better risk-based decisions on how to maximize uh, the cleanup effort while minimizing the taxpayer dollars in that, in that way. And, and then ultimately, as all that progress that Ty talked about and Brian talked about along that river as we consolidate down inside to the 200 east and 200 west area on the central plateau, it allows us to consolidate our service delivery uh, at the right time. So we're not overspending what we need and, ma and maximizing doing that. And when you look at um, the first one of our three main areas, our integrated service delivery model, uh, there's a couple things that, that, that are really kind of important here. So, um, we've been able to save a little bit through cost savings and cost avoidance about $1.5 billion so far over the 10 years of this contract. That, that's really important because what it's allowed us to do is to, to take a risk-based protocol and process to shift it into the right areas of emphasis to continue to do risk reduction. A lot of that river corridor activity was great progress that was made. It allowed us to free up to continue to do risk reduction on infrastructure on the tank farms, uh, to be able to go to deal with that and deal with uh, uh, deal with vapors and move forward and allowed Val to kind of continue to execute what she's doing. Where it becomes imperative for us from the current situation to the future situation is, uh, it really is now allowing us to go off and take our older infrastructure that's under the table that people may not see, for instance, all of our business management systems are very old and very archaic. Um, 
And we're in a situation today in society where you need to be able to simulate that data and be able to deal with that data very rapidly. So the business management system upgrades to be able to take us for, we show here 50 applications down to eight. Really what it's allowing us to do is take a whole lot of information and data and assimilate it rapidly so we can make more rapid decisions um, as we condense the Hanford site down to the central plateau and are on top of each other, working around each other on a lot more regular basis. So um, that really becomes important for us as we move forward to line that up and allow these services that we provide to the other contractors as well as information to be able to give to, to the Department of Energy and ourselves to make appropriate decisions that we need to do. In our support services, so uh, I take a great deal of pride and ownership in all the progress that we've made over the last 10 years. So uh, way our services we work, we provide crane and rigging, we provide Teamsters, we provide workers that are literally tied at the hip with uh, the other contractors working in to make progress at PFP and along the river corridor and in tank farms. And so whenever they make great progress, it, it, we, we are in tied with that. And so take a great deal of pride and ownership in what we've been able to do. Um, in our support service area, you can kind of see the demand is continuing to increase, um, but not at a substantial rate. But the difference is on those support services and those integrated services and where they're at is, we had people spread across 586 square miles over the last course of the last 10 years. As we've now been made that progress around the river corridor and the outer areas, we're condensing those same amount of people, those 10, 12,000 people on the site right down into the central plateau area. And really what we're doing is we're condensing them down on the east side, the 200 east area mainly, as we go to operations and make glass. So now your infrastructure and your support and where your people are going on are all going to the same spot. So our ability to assimilate data and make decisions becomes very important because a decision that was okay to be made over here in a vacuum because it was 45 miles down the road is no longer you're within 100 yards of the other group. So our ability to make those decisions with our support services uh, to be able to give that. The one that I feel a great deal of pride because I used to work at tank farms at WRPS in the past is our self-contained breathing apparatuses, which we provide support to the other contractor at WRPS so they can go into the farms. Um, they've made a great deal of progress on the ability to protect our workforce in a way that allows us flexibility to be able to uh, go in and do work and remove that demand on SCBA bottles. So what you don't see there is the next part of this is a tip off where that's going back down the other way. And we're no longer gonna need to provide that service because uh, they've effectively been able to protect our workforce and allow it, enable us to do better cleanup. So, um, and our physical services, which is where everybody kind of likes to focus in. And it's, it's an important piece because you expect when you come to work that you have water, that you have power, that you have sewer, uh, and that you can go effectively execute. And you can see uh, just the usage demands uh, in the different areas where we're gonna increase. What we've been able to do through, through our service delivery model is really integrate, take all the information where the demands are at, uh, on, both on increase in demands and how they're shifting to different locations and putting maybe a, an extra demand on one road only, where other ones now we can go turn off. Uh, and we've been able to integrate that together and ferret out. That's where we've been able to kind of ferret out that $1.5 billion in cost savings and cost avoidance. And then the last one is down on the bottom down there is in our IT technology. So, so John talked earlier about the digital transformation that's going on tank farms. We're really doing that across the Hanford site. And, and um, really where we're at right now is taking all of this massive amounts of data we have and being able to assimilate it together rapidly so that we can actually make some decisions off of that. Additionally, what the, making those decisions off that, we're also playing the infrastructure in place that at the right time is actually allows us to start doing some machine learning capabilities to where not only now can you make the decisions, maybe at some point in the future at the right time, you can actually use that to actually have the machine take the action for you to save you time and energy and efforts. As simple as reordering materials and equipment when we integrate that says, we all need gloves across the site and we just go reorder the gloves versus a person right now is manually tracking it and manually ordering it. You take that person out of the equation so you can continue to free up and focus your, your attention and energy at the highest risk and highest evolutions. So uh, what it's also doing is it's helping us att attract and retrain the next generation of our workforce is about half our workforce is changing out or right in the middle of that is uh, attracting and retraining people to what we're doing that's actually on the front end of cleanup uh, and also infusing technology into that to, to track, retrain and bring people in to help us continue to reduce our costs while we're making progress and, and moving forward with that. So and with that, I'll turn it over to Brian. So I think 
I think what you've heard really is uh, a representation of the last 10 years, but I think it's important to recognize from a 30-year perspective what has been accomplished in the environmental cleanup mission has been truly impactful and, and frankly astounding. Um, almost 900 facilities demolished by the work done at the site. Over 1,300 waste sites remediated, as Ty mentioned before. Uh, over 20 billion, with a B, gallons of groundwater treated. And again, we mentioned 2.5 billion just this, this year. Um, that work uh, has been uh, you know, done safely, effectively, efficiently, and I think we've made tremendous progress at the site in the first 30 years of the cleanup. And as I look to the future, based on our history, not only during the environmental cleanup mission, but also during the, 70, uh, the 45 years of, of the national security mission, the innovation, the dedication, the commitment of the team at the Hanford site has created successes um, when confronted with numerous challenges over that protracted period of time. And, and that spirit, I think, is still here. As Val talked about it, we see it at the site today and the energy of the people there. I think it's here today, and I think that's going to be one of the things that certainly helps us continue the, the history of success or the story of success at the Hanford site as we go forward. So really phenomenal, and, and that, again, that, that gives me certainly tremendous hope for the future and optimism that this is the right team and the model that we have uh, going forward to be successful. If you look at the next five years, um, the first thing I think is most important to recognize is we're entering a period of dynamic change at the Hanford site. Um, as a natural part of the government contracting process, um, we're in the process now and, and we'll soon be awarding contracts for, other than the waste treatment plant, all the other contracts on the site are going to be, uh, are in the process of going to be awarded. So we're going to change out the contract leadership um, for the Central Plateau, the tank farms, and mission support um, in the next several months. That alone is a significant change, but also as you look to the farther into the future, we're also preparing the organization and the culture and the Hanford team for a transition to operations 24-7, 365, as we've talked about. And that is a fundamental shift in pace and focus that requires us to look at every element of how we do business, whether it's public works and our response times through our management uh, and leadership and decision-making processes to make sure that we, as the managers and owners and leaders of the site, can operate at the pace at the site so we remain relevant as we move forward into the tank waste cleanup mission. Um, if you look, DF Law operations is, is large and in capitals for a very good reason. That will be, that's the centerpiece of what we'll be focused on um, over the next several years. Um, and it is a site-wide machine. It is not just about the waste treatment plant. Every, both of the DOE offices and every contractor on the site have a role in ensuring that we can deliver waste feed delivery and deliver glass from the vitrification plant as we go forward. And our overall operating model has to, again, evolve to support that pace um, of operations. But that doesn't mean that we're not gonna continue risk reduction activities across the site as well. We still have work to complete at PFP um, and redox. We still have groundwater pump and treat. We have five pump and treat um, uh, stations that are gonna continue to operate and continue to reduce the risk of the river. We'll continue to work at the K Basin to get the last two re uh, reactors cocooned of the, of the eight we're gonna cocoon. The ninth is a national park. Um, and we'll complete the 324 building as well in this window over the next five years. Um, and there will be other risk um, reduction that we'll find as we progress the work. As Ty mentioned, there's other activities on the site that we have to continue to pursue because as the work gets central, more and more central and more and more connected between the contractors, issues that affect one contractor ultimately affect all and could affect our ability to execute the mission with direct feedlot activity waste. And so we have to be mindful of that. Um, and we're gonna continue to increase and improve our infrastructure. The infrastructure has to support the operations and we'll right size that. We're not gonna put infrastructure into areas we've already remediated, but we will have to ensure the infrastructure supports 24-7, 365 operations on the Central Plateau. We're gonna continue our tank integrity programs to ensure the tanks continue to safely contain the waste until the point where we can uh, remediate through vitrification. Um, we're gonna continue risk reduction and we're gonna continue to look for acceleration opportunities. This site, the mission is decades long in front of us. 
So we want to continue to find opportunities and employee opportunities that we can safely, efficiently, effectively, again, accelerate the mission um, and reduce the risk to the river, reduce the risk to the public, and reduce the risk to the environment. As we think about the enablers um, that the department's focused on with our contractors, there's four enablers for what will be required to be a part of our culture moving forward. <laughs> One is the operations mindset. I talked about that a little bit. But it's again, it's going from a site where if we have a electrical issue in a, in a, de, a demolition and decommissioning world um, where we could come, you know, it occurs on a Thursday, we can come back next Monday and go back to work. And we have two melters operating 24-7, 365. Our time horizon for, for responding is on the order of hours, not days, not weeks, not months. And so our entire operational posture and everything we do has to evolve to that. And that's a cultural transition, not just for the 350 federal employees, it's for the eight to nine to 10,000 on the site that are doing this work every day. Uh, John's team is gonna have to be doing transfers multiple times a day where we're doing sometimes a couple a month. So the pace there, the pace in public works, certainly at the waste treatment plant, um, and with Ty's team at the integrated disposal facility, both offices, all four contractors across the site working to make the machine work, which we all focus very heavily on, but it's also making the, the, the team be, be prepared to function in a way that's fundamentally different. The second area we focus on is strengthen our relationships with the, all of our stakeholders. Um, that includes the local communities and the governments, the regulators, uh, labor, regional uh, governments and communities, including Oregon, tribal nations, Hanford Advisory Board, Oregon Hanford Cleanup Board, state and national regulators and defense nuclear facility safety board and i could go on so we have to continue to work with all the key stakeholders so they understand how we're making progress safely how we're making progress efficiently how we're making progress effectively and that every dollar that comes to the hanford site is using use, being used well to progress this challenging mission and we're committed to that we'll continue to do that we've started uh hanford regional dialogues again we've had multiple, uh, three in the last six months, sessions out on the site to connect directly from the department to the workforce to make sure that we're plugged in with the workforce as well. And we'll continue that outreach because the, the support of the stakeholder uh, world that the Hanford lives in is critical to our success going forward. Um, third, we're gonna be a fair and demanding customer as Department of Energy. We own the site. We are the only customer on the site. We're gonna be knowledgeable, we're gonna be engaged, we're gonna work with our contractors. There'll be issues we don't agree with. Um, we're gonna talk constructively and openly so we together we can continue to, to, to move the mission forward. And I guarantee you we're not always gonna agree. I guarantee you there's gonna be issues that are gonna be challenges for us to move the mission forward. But as a, as a involved customer, a fair customer, um, a demanding customer, we, we're gonna be in a place where we're, we're, we have world-class contractors working on the site. We have to get world-class performance and to achieve that, we're gonna be a world-class customer to support that. Um, and lastly, really, that wraps all of it together is a high-performing team. Uh, not just the department, the department with our contractors, the department with all our stakeholders, we have to work together more effectively and efficiently than we ever have bef before to continue to make progress here. Um, and, and this is a uniquely challenging site. But again, because of our history, because of the last 75 years, both the National Security Mission and the Environmental Cleanup Mission, I'm optimistic that we can continue to work together continue to stay engaged um, with our key stakeholders, continue to um, support the progress that is, has been made and will continue to be made uh, because it's important um, for the region, it's important for the state, and it's certainly important from a national perspective as well. And the Department of Energy is committed to that from, from our level certainly all the way up to the Secretary. Um, if you look at um, our way ahead, I think it's bright, I think it is, it is certainly challenging but I think we're positioned today uh, well for the challenges of the future. And it's a as a result of the work we've done that we can ensure that we can be successful going forward across the entire spectrum of the work we do throughout uh, the rest of the mission that we have in front of us. Uh, with that, I believe the presentation is complete. I certainly appreciate your time for all of us to be here today to represent where we are today and where we're going in the future. And we're certainly happy to take questions. My question to you today is, uh, how, do, how does funding look with the environment that we have at a national level and all the things happening in the world? What is the challenges to, to 
to stay uh, or to get the funding to stay on schedule with all this process? I, I think the, the most important thing for us as a Hanford site and a team is to continue to deliver safe, efficient, and effective progress with every dollar we do receive. Uh, we, we, have, we enjoy great support from the Department of Energy um, and great support from the administration and certainly great support from our congressional delegation uh, to ensure that we're getting the funding we need. Um, I think Congressman Newhouse has been out here often enough where he could probably give the tour on the site and Rich may want to do that in the future. Um, but we, were, we had 22 VIP tours this summer which included Senator Cantwell, uh, Congressman Newhouse, Congressman Schreier, uh, up, and, up to and including the Secretary of Energy. And, and so I think our ability to show people the progress on a site that people really can't visualize unless they're here um, is an important part of that. And certainly the support we, we get from the community, uh, the support we get from the state legislators is also very important. And so that's part of the outreach piece that I, we want to stay committed to. We need to continue to communicate how we're doing, what we're doing, um, and be open and transparent, get the feedback of the community to ensure that that support uh, for the work um, that we do receive remains solid. Um, we've also focused very heavily on an ethical culture at the site to ensure that um, when we talk about the site and we talk about the, there is a lot of money, $2.5 billion a year is a lot of money, we want to make sure that everyone has confidence, all of our stakeholders, uh, local all the way through national, have, stick, have confidence that this is a place where those dollars are going to be well spent and, and going to be protected by every member of the DOE team, whether it's the department or the contractors that are doing work here. We'll just have to continue to maintain that focus. So I think we get great support. I think it's, you know, part of the reality here is um, this is, this is an expensive effort. And we all recognize that um, and we'll just continue to show the progress that continues to draw the support and the dollars and I think we get great support for that. Uh, Chuck Torelli, City of Kenway. Um, how can the community support you and your efforts and in real concrete ways, not, you know, you don't need a parade, you need what? You need letters to our representatives, you need what do you need to be successful? And where do you think you can be more helpful in informing us of those needs? And I'll start, and then I think certainly the, the <coughs> other members of the team here will talk. But I think we do enjoy great support from the community already. I think part of that, that uh, effort that we, we place is making sure that we're engaged with the community, communicating our progress, um, and making sure that we're um, getting the community's concerns and priorities factored in to the, how we, our decision making and our actions going forward. Um, the broader area issue is, you know, the community's done a great job of making the Tri-Cities a great place to live. And so as we look to the future and we look to the challenges we face, um, we have a, you know, if you look at this panel, not including Val, we're a mature group. Um, and Come so, on, only 25. <laughs> so, you know, the, the, we, we do have an aging workforce, a lot of experience on the site, a lot of people retiring. Um, I had one of my fact reps retired this week um, from the site and so we are losing that that generation of people that have been here for a while and to attract the next generation um, they have to recognize that the work at Hanford they can have a a great career a diverse career doing something important to this to the the local communities the region and the nation and live in a great place um, you know I've lived in a lot of places in Hanford and, and Tri-Cities is a great place to live and so as long as we can continue to do that um, and support WSU Tri-Cities and support degrees and, and work there because parents in the local communities, believe it or not, usually want their kids to live here. And if we want to go and recruit and retain, we can go and be very successful at WSU Tri-Cities and bring in people out to the site as well, not just from a federal perspective, but, but with, across all the contractors as well. And so that's the support that is very helpful um, and very constructive. And I think, again, continuing to ensure your voices are heard um, at the state level um, and certainly at the national level always is provides support for what we're doing here. Um, others as well? Yeah, I'd just like to add is I think one of the things that we have to do better and, and I think one of these items that we have is succinctly showing and articulating the progress we are making because this is a long mission 
and in a society that is very um, need information now or want information now, we got to be able to succinctly provide you that data. And, and, and some of these pictures and some of these things are as intent for us to go off and better to do that. I think the community has always extremely w well supported the backbone of what Hamper's doing. That's a way we can help enable you to help uh, us collectively. And the second part of it is, I think from a community perspective is, uh, those people, those kids that we're bringing up through WSU that we're trying to keep here is, Tri-Cities has a great science-based, technology-based infrastructure at Hanford, at PNNL, at Lamb Weston, and a lot of the infrastructure around it and the people around it. And so we're collectively, I think, together to, to make sure we need to on large scale integrate as a community to make sure that we go off and continue to encourage those kids. It doesn't necessarily have to be at Hanford, right? We're all kind of fighting for the same type of people. And so that need is going to be large in the, in the near future. And so collectively together, I think we need to leverage our capacity and capability to encourage young kids to get educated in a field that they're choosing, whether it's Hanford or PNNL um, or Lamb Weston, and potentially in all in all of it, as we change our skill dynamics over a period of time. This year, our community celebrated the 75th anniversary of the Hanford site. And I would like to thank all of you for your participation in that celebration. It was very exciting. Uh, we had people from uh, a long ways away that came and, and just were so thrilled um, that it was organized and um, that we had that opportunity to look back. So thank you. Um, as we go forward um, with contract transition, um, our community elected officials find um, that there's a lot of uncertainty. People don't know if their jobs are going to continue. Um, can you tell us how you're working um, to plan for that transition and to uh, keep things moving forward? I think that's for me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we recognize that the contract transitions, it's, an, it's a natural part of government, government business. And so the contractors um, that we have on the site today uh, we're likely some some members of the contract teams here today were here at the last contract transition and the contractors focus very heavily on being able to complete a scope of work complete a time where they're in the in the role um, finish strong and turn over the work to the next contractor so to progress from that perspective and i think they um and, and the, the work we've done to date i think uh, with john and ty and and bob i think that that's a commitment that we see um, already in the workforce. I've talked to each of the contractor presidents at the on the day when the awards are announced. If the workforce is distracted, don't work. Spend that day, focus on safety, answer the, the questions of the workforce, and go back to work when, when you're ready. We can't afford to have someone to get hurt um, in this transition. Uh, because that certainly would, would, would mar what is a natural part of government contracting and put the, the, the Hanford site in a position that, that I think none of us want. We want everybody that's participating in the site today to see the successes and be part of the successes in the future. Um, Val, I'm sure, will be working with us um, because most of the interfaces of all the contractors touch the waste treatment plant. And so the Bechtel team will continue to be engaged with the contractors to make sure those interfaces are well managed uh, as we go forward. And again, this is a process that we've executed in, a, in the past. Um, I'm not on this side of the table, but I, I have seen it in other places and, and we're ready for it, as ready as we can be, and we'll continue to work the problem as we transition to make sure it's done safely and effectively. Thank you so much. This has just been an incredible opportunity for our organization to have all of you in one place. and. Um, the information that you shared is heartening and exciting, and um, you're doing an amazing job. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate, appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. To find out how you can become more involved in this important regional issue, or to have a Hanford Community speaker talk to your organization, contact the Hanford Communities at 509-942-7348, or visit our website.